We say that a statement is a tautology if it is always true, no matter what truth or otherwise is, in, is uh, assumed about parts of it. So, for example, P or not P is always true. Because either P is true, so P or not P therefore is true, or P is false, in which case not P is true, so P or not P is true. There is no way that I can make the statement that P is true or P is not true, not true. So if I use the example that P is the statement, I own a pet dog, then the tautology would be, I own a pet dog, or I do not own a pet dog, because it doesn't matter whether you own a dog or not, you definitely do own a dog, or you don't own a dog. So the statement, I own a pet dog, or I don't own a pet dog, is tautological, so because it is always true. So when we look at truth tables, we'd identify a statement, usually a compound statement, which is a tautology by seeing a column entirely of truth, of ones. And I suppose the opposite of something which is tautological is something which is contradictory. So we say a statement is a contradiction if it is always false, regardless of uh, the inputs. So, for example, P and not P is always false. There is no statement which I can make which is simultaneously true and false. Because if it's true, then it's not false. And if it's false, then it's not true. So it's definitely not true and false simultaneously. So again, if I use the pet dog ownership example, the statement, I own a pet dog and I don't own a pet dog together are a contradiction. I can't say I own a pet dog and I don't own a pet dog because that will definitely be false. And again, I would spot contradictory statements by just seeing a column of zeros or a column of falses. But there is no combination of inputs which can possibly make the output true. Now, this is actually a very, very important concept in logic and when we look at proofs, because one of the major or powerful methods of proof is proof by contradiction. We now expand the definition of a statement to contain a variable. So I can have here a statement P which depends on a variable x. So I'm going to say the statement P of x, so P brackets x, and that is defined, I'll say it in words, x is an even integer. An integer being um, a number, real number with zero, the decimal part. So x is an even integer integer. Now that of course means that p of x may or may not be true depending on what the variable x is set as. So p2 is true because 2 is an even integer whereas p3 is false because the statement 3 is an even integer is false because 3 is an integer but it's an odd number. Now the input variable doesn't actually need to be 
a number. It doesn't need to be anything quantitative. It could be something qualitative or a label. So I could have the, the name of a person as the variable. So Q of X could be the statement that X skipped breakfast this morning, that X didn't eat breakfast this morning. So maybe X, you put your own name in there. And if you skip breakfast this morning, then Q of your name is true. Whereas if you ate breakfast this morning, then Q of your name would be false because you didn't skip breakfast this morning. And we can have statements which have what we call quantifiers. And this is more notation. Um, these are very, very important bits of mathematical and logical notation. We've got very used to, presumably since primary school, knowing the addition sign, the multiplication sign, things like that. Earlier in these videos, we introduced the AND and OR notation and the NOT notation. But we introduce here the FOR ALL notation, which is this, what looks like an upside down capital A, an open angle with a line through it, and that means for all or for every case. And we've also got the notation which looks like a back to front capital E, which means that there exists. So in dealing with for all, the obvious question being all, all of what? So a for all statement, generally it helps in terms of being rigorous to mean, to, to define what we mean by all. So we have a universe of discourse, which means the set of all objects for which we're evaluating or potentially evaluating this statement. Mathematically, this might be all real numbers, all positive real numbers, all integers. So I say for all real numbers, for all positive numbers. Define the universe of discourse, basically what am I talking about? And then the for all, for all things in that universe this statement is true, or for all things in this universe, this statement is not true. Now, I could also have non-quantitative ones. I could say for all, or say everybody, and by everybody, I mean everybody living in Australia, or everybody living right now, or everybody who's ever lived or died. So obviously those have slightly different implications. It helps to be clear about what I mean by the set of all things I might be evaluating the statement over. I'm now just introducing the statement here in some mathematical notation. Now, for some of you who have used this notation before, this might be very easy to interpret. If not, don't worry, talk us through it. So reading from left to right, this statement says, for all or for every X, where X belongs to Z, the capital Z bar down, is the set of all integers. So an integer is a real number with zero decimal part. So one is an integer, eight is an integer, 43 is an integer, minus 43 is an integer. So for every integer x, there exists an x squared, which is also an integer. So this is just saying for every integer I could pick x, there exists a value x squared, which is an integer. I said x is one, x squared is 1, which is also an integer. x is 10, x squared is 100, which is also an integer. Now that statement, I hope we can see intuitively, is true. 
Now I can write down a similar statement, which is not true. Here I'm saying for every x squared that I choose as an integer, there exists an x, which is also an integer. Now, of course, if I pick x squared is 3, there's no integer that I can square to give the answer 3. I mean, there is a square root of 3, but the square root of 3 is not an integer. And the statement claims for every x squared, which is an integer, there exists x, which is an integer. Whereas that statement about picking something which I can take the square root of and get an integer is sometimes true. Sure, 4 has a square root, which is an integer. 2. 100 has a square root, which is an integer. 10. But the statement says for all x squared, which is an integer, there exists an integer x, which is, uh, there exists an integer x, and that is not true. I could, though, get the statement to be true if I change the universe of discourse and said for every x squared which is a positive real number there exists an x which is a real positive number it was the restriction of only talking about integers so ones that had zero in the decimal part that made that statement untrue so it's a good example that of where the universe of discourse, what, what do I mean by for all, for all belonging to this universe? Yes, but what's in this universe that I'm talking about? Negating quantified statements is one of these topics where it's very easy to do it quickly and, and make simple mistakes. Just what we're talking about, how we negate statements like for every or there exists. So if I start with a statement, every dog has four legs, the negation of that statement is not every dog does not have four legs. It is not every dog has four legs and not every dog has four legs. For that to be true, I'd simply have to find a counterexample to every dog has four legs, i.e. I'd need to find at least one dog which did not have four legs. If I could find a three-legged dog or a two-legged dog, I could say the statement every dog has four legs is untrue. If I could find a five-legged dog, that would also be the case. So I'm going to define my universe of discourse to be the set of all dogs, and x is just one thing I pick from that universe. And my statement p of x is going to be the statement this dog, dog x. So if x is a member of the set of dogs, then p of x is the statement that this dog has four legs. So the statement every dog has four legs I would write in mathematical or logical notation as for all x, p of x. That's saying for all x, the statement p of x is true. That for every dog that exists, the statement this dog has four legs is true. That is how I would claim every dog has four legs. If I wanted to negate that and just sort of have an example which is not true, I would don't have to find that every dog doesn't have four legs. The way that I would negate a all, the opposite of all is effectively not all, i.e. at least one case is not true. So the negation simply says that there exists a dog which does not have four legs. So what I would say is within this universe of discourse, which is the set of all dogs, there exists at least one dog x such that 
not p of x. There exists at least one dog such that not this dog has four legs, i.e. this dog does not have four legs. All I would need to do to negate the statement is to have um, there exists one dog, which there exists at least one dog, which does not have four legs. What this gives me is that negating the statement for all x, p of x is true, is that there exists an x, possibly one, possibly more of them, but there exists an x such that not p of x is true. And obviously not p of x is true is the same as p of x is false. And I've got the same the other way around. If I want to negate that there exists an x such that p of x is true, to negate that, I would show that for all x, not p of x is true, or for all x, p of x is false. So the negation of there exists an x such that p of x is true, I have no, for all x, p of x is not true. Now, some of these concepts can be quite sort of overwhelming to start with, but we will practice and reinforce and re-embed these things over the coming weeks through these videos and through the accompanying, accompanying um, workshop and tutorial materials.